I'm very glad that each of you are here. And I'm surprised anyone even noticed that it was cold out. Oh, when you come in and see everybody bundled up and freezing, and <laughs> you kind of know something's up out there, don't you? But it's still a wonderful day in which to come together and worship God. No matter what the weather is, it's a wonderful day when we can come together like this and worship and serve our Master. <clears throat> Have you ever been asked that if you were saved and if you're sure that you're saved? We have been looking at this question for the past couple of weeks, realizing the various answers that some might give, and sadly that some, a lot of Christians, would simply say, well, I hope so, uh, while others, I don't know, uh, and then maybe with that, I hope so. Or others with, well, we won't really know until the judgment. But the Bible teaches that we can know. And that we can know that we know. One of the reasons John wrote the book of 1 John was so that we can know that we have eternal life. And thus, the book of 1 John itself becomes, in a sense, a, a test of the assur on the assurance that we have of eternal life. And so we started looking at that from that aspect real and realized first that John sets forth that we can know that we have eternal life, that we're saved, because Jesus has come. Uh, he starts off uh, the first few verses of the book, setting forth that here's Jesus of Nazareth. We have seen him, we've handled him, we've uh, heard him, that he is truly the word of life. And thus we can know we have that life because he has come, that he was seen of witnesses. And we looked at several aspects of the way in which Jesus came. That he came as the Lamb of God, as John declared John the first chapter. That would take away the sins of the world. That he came to for the express purpose of giving his life upon Calvary's tree. He came to be the propitiation for our sins. The idea of propitiation is an appeasement in which Man has committed sin, and the wages of sin is death. And thus all men deserved that wage of death. But God being a just God, he must execute the death penalty upon man. Instead, Jesus stepped in for us, and he took that punishment for us, and thus he became the appeasement for that wrath of God that comes upon the children of disobedience. And thus he came to be the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 2 and verse 2. And obviously he came to thus shed his blood because that's the way in which he would be the propitiation for our sins. In the shedding of his blood upon Calvary's tree. And thus, here's this Jesus of Nazareth, and he is the Son of God, and he was proved to be such by the resurrection from the dead, we find in uh, Romans 1 and verse 4. We also know because we keep the commandments. The motive of that keeping of the commandments is because we love Him. But that love of God is the keeping of God's commandments, and His commandments are not grievous, 1 John 5 and verse 3. And so we need to obey the plan that God has set forth for man to be saved. That obedience is a necessity, as is shown in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and verse 9, and Romans 6, verse 17 and 18. That in that obedience, we must believe in God. 
that we must believe that Jesus is God. Um, in uh, several of the groups that I am on, and about the only thing that I do in, on Facebook, um, I think it's a blight upon society, actually, but uh, one of the things that I do is try to teach people. And I am the administrator of several groups in that, and one person was asking about uh, having responses made if he responds to an original post. I said, yes, that's allowed. We encourage it. And he didn't really want that because he doesn't believe, as he refers to as the Trinity, he thinks that's a laughable doctrine. Well, I don't use the term Trinity. I use the term Godhead because that's the word God uses. But John the 8th chapter, says, Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And I told him, you're going to die in your sins and you're going to spend eternity in torment. Now, he, might, he probably didn't like that, but uh, that's all right. He at least knows his standing before God now, if no one else had told him before. That individual is lost because he does not believe that Jesus is that I am. Well, Jesus says you have to believe that or you're going to die. And we must believe that Jesus died for our sins. That's the gospel. He, Mark 16, 15, and 16, we are to preach the gospel in all the world. That gospel is that how that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Then we must repent. That is, we turn away from sin to turn to God in God's appointed way, to do and to live thus in God's way. And as Jesus said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5. We must confess Christ, even as Peter did, Matthew the 16th chapter and verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus asked the apostles, Whom do ye say that I am? And we see the Ethiopian in Acts the 8th chapter doing that very thing. And then we must be baptized in water, into Christ for the remission of our sins. And it has to be for that purpose that God gave. To do it for another purpose will not satisfy God's requirements. The purpose is for our salvation, for the remission of our sins. Those are the same thing. It's expressing it in different ways. Uh, to get into Christ, again... In Christ is where salvation is. That's where all spiritual blessings are. Ephesians 1 verse 3, 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy uh, 2 and verse 10. Well, those are different ways of expressing the same idea. That's the purpose of baptism. And if you do it for some other reason, then you're not doing what God says. You're not obeying God. You must do it when He says. That is, an individual must believe, he must repent, he must make that confession. That excludes babies and small infants growing up because they don't have the capability of doing that and they don't have any sins for which to re re receive remission. So you have to do it when he says it. You have to do it how he says it. That is being immersed in water. You have to do it uh, in all of those aspects of obedience. But then we also need to notice that once we become a Christian, that act of baptism is that act that takes us from being outside of Christ and places us into Christ, Romans 6, verse 3 and verse 4, and Galatians 3, 27. We then, being in Christ now, must live in continued obedience. We have to remain faithful to God. In, Roman, or in Matthew, the 10th chapter, and... Uh, Jesus is, on this occasion, sending out his apostles, the disciples, uh, 70, on a limited commission. And he tells them of how they're going to be hated, but he tells them in verse 22 that ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. As you go preaching the kingdom of God, you're going to be hated by men. That's a general principle. That's going to take place, not just to those who are being sent out on that limited commission, but to us today. 
as we go out preaching the gospel of the kingdom of Christ, the world's going to hate us. They're not going to appreciate us telling them they're lost, what to do to be saved. We're not, they're not going to appreciate the eternal torment that is awaiting those who are, do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. And so, yes, the world will hate us, even as it hated those disciples that Jesus was sending out in the limited commission. What's the... What is it that we must do? We must endure to the end. We have to continue on if we expect to be saved. We cannot allow the hatred and the persecution that will come upon us to allow us to forego doing what God says and living in obedience to Him. In Revelation, the second chapter, Jesus is giving a warning and it says, To fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye shall be tried ten days. Or ye shall have tribulation ten days. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now, he's setting forth in those, the first part of the verse what's going to come upon those, the church there. There's going to be this great persecution that comes. And some of you will be cast into prison. Some of you are going to even be put to death. But he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. The idea of being faithful unto death, in this case, is not specifically dealing, you continue to be faithful your entire life. That's not what he means by this statement, Be thou faithful unto death. It means if being faithful causes you to be put to death, you remain faithful. Now guess what? If you remain faithful, even if it causes you to be put to death, that does mean you're going to remain faithful all the way till you're put until you die. And so it would embrace that aspect as a secondary area, but the real th thrust of what Jesus is saying on this occasion here, this persecution is going to come. It's going to be a fiery trial. You're going to be tried. And some of you, for the cause of Christ, will be put to death. You remain faithful even if it causes you to be put to death. Then you'll receive the crown of life. We as Christians must remain faithful. The faithfulness is that, that which we need to center our minds upon. You remain faithful. You endure. There's going to be things that come up in life. There's going to be problems. There's going to be trials that we face. Satan's going to be out there. He's going to be trying everything that he can to get us to come to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John 2, verse 15, uh, 16. Don't succumb to it. Remain faithful to God. And it's interesting in 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, we oftentimes uh, refer to this passage in relationship to those two classes that, G that Paul mentions that are going to suffer torment. Those two classifications, those who do not know God, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they're going to be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That word that's translated there, obey, when it's obey, not the gospel, in the Greek, it's in the present tense. Now, the present tense means it is continuous action. It's not a one-time action. That would be the aorist tense, by the way. It's not found in that tense of aorist tense of a one-time completed action. He is saying, you must continue to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ or else you will be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 
if it was in the aorist tense, and it could have been, then we would have that reference to that obedience that we would see in becoming a Christian and in that act of baptism. But he's saying, no, it doesn't stop there. Just becoming a Christian is not sufficient. You can become a Christian and still be lost. The possibility of apostasy is always there for all of us in spite of the Calvinistic doctrine of the impossibility of it. He's saying, you have to, yes, there's that initial obedience, but there has to be a continued obedience through your life. Or else you're going to be lost. That's remaining faithful to God. And without that faithfulness to God, the end result is you're not going to receive the crown of life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. You're going to be punished with that everlasting destruction there in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. But if we want to be saved, we have to remain faithful. We have to continue in that obedience to God. Another thing that is necessary in living in obedience to God is that we're going to have to study the scriptures and then apply those scriptures to our life. As the book of Psalms begins, the first psalm, the psalmist uh, David proclaims the blessed man, that the blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the way of sinners. The blessed man does not sit in the seat of the scornful. But verse 2, he tells us what the blessed man does after telling, him what he, telling us what he does not do. What does the blessed man do? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3, he tells us the results of that. That he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. There's going to be some strength that's there. But the blessed man is that one who has a delight in God's work, the law of the Lord. I wonder how many, how many of us really have a joy in God's word. Well, let me ask, how many of us study God's word on a daily basis? Now, when we fall in love with someone, We remember back, and we fall in love, and we just want to be with that person all of the time, don't we? We want to spend time, we want to make time to be, and we'll forgo other things so that we can be with that person that we've fallen in love with. Do we have a love for the Scriptures? Do we have a love for God's Word? I know none of you realize that I enjoy football, and specifically the Cowboys. I know none of y'all knew that. But guess what? I enjoy a good game. And when that game is tied and close, I really get excited, and that's enjoyment for it. I want to watch that. And I, you know, this afternoon uh, when the Cowboys come on, I'm going to be in front of the TV. I'm going to be watching the, the game. And I'm going to be involved with some others and talking about the game and what's going on. Why? Because I have an enjoyment there. I find a delight in that. Do we find a delight in God's Word? During the week, even though the cowboys aren't playing, they're practicing and things are going on, and I'm reading about it. Why? Because I have a joy there. I have a delight there. Uh, you know, I'm using that from a personal standpoint. There's things that you like, that you will talk about all of the time, that you're going to find enjoyment about. Do we find that type of joy, that type of a delight in God's Word? 
so that we're studying it, we're talking about it all the time, we're reading the scriptures on a daily basis and studying those and then applying them to our life. And when we're not reading and studying, we're meditating upon it, we're dwelling over those scriptures that we've studied, we're thinking about them, trying to see how they apply within our life. That's the blessed man that, that David talks about in Psalm 1. His delight, his joy, is found in God's Word, meditating upon it, thinking upon it. Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, Satan says, you know, you've been up here 40 days without food. Here are some stones over here. Tur turn those stones into bread. You're hungry, go ahead and do that and eat. And Jesus' response is, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We have to have an understanding that God's word is that which feeds us. Well, in our daily life, if we don't take physical nourishment, if we don't feed our bodies, guess what happens to our bodies? They shrivel up and die. When we don't feed our spiritual body, that spiritual body shrivels up and dies. And you cannot get a good diet of God's Word by coming to worship services on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Bible classes Sunday morning and Wednesday night. There's just a, not enough that we can do during that period of time to give us a good spiritual diet of God's Word. And if we rely simply upon those times, then we're going to shrivel up and die, spiritually speaking. Man doesn't live by the physical alone. Man's spiritual aspect is far more important. Many times I had wondered, I think I've got it worked out in my mind, what was the temptation there in turning the bread into, or the rocks into bread? What, what would have been wrong with that? I think it's found in that aspect that it's not the physical, and Satan is basically saying, let the physical take priority over the spiritual. Your physical nourishment is more important than the spiritual. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not. The spiritual is more important than the physical. And thus, it would be wrong to turn that, those stones into bread in order to satisfy the physical body. Because the spiritual is more important than the physical. I wish Christians could learn that lesson. That's taught so many times and in so many ways in the Bible. Think of Jesus on the cross, for example. Here's a physical family that he had. Apparently his earthly father, Joseph, had died at this point in time. And here's his mother, Mary. And what does he do? Well, as being the oldest child, it would be his responsibility to take care of the mother. He's dying now. It would be not natural to turn his responsibility over to the next in line within the physical family. But he doesn't appeal to the physical family. He says... John, wait a minute, John wasn't part of that physical family, but he was a spiritual family. And Jesus, by that, shows us the spiritual takes priority over the physical. Look at the time in which they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, and a great storm arises. And the men, the apostles are up there, some of them fishermen who were used to those type of storms, and yet they are afraid of their life. And Jesus is down in the boat, and he's asleep. And then he chastises them for their lack of faith. 
Why? Because he's showing the spiritual is more important. What difference would it make if you died physically? It doesn't matter. If you die physically, the spiritual is what is important. You see the same thing later on. It's interesting. Jesus was asleep on that occasion in Matthew uh, 26 chapter when Jesus is along with Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he goes off to pray, and they fall asleep. He comes back and wakes them up and tells them to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, and they fall asleep again. He's telling them the spiritual is more important. Yes, the physical body, I realize there's a need for sleep at times, but the spiritual is more important. You need to be watching and praying. Well, what about the sleep that I need? You need to be watching and praying so you don't enter into temptation. What happened? Peter fell asleep and later on he sinned and betraying his Lord and Master. Why? Because he wasn't watching and praying back here in the garden. Spiritual is more important than the physical. The physical needs that one has. Look at the persecution that Paul suffered, 2 Corinthians 11th chapter. And all of the things that he went through. It says it doesn't mean anything to it. In fact, if you go back to the 4th chapter of that same book, while in the 11th chapter he talks about the persecution, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more eternal and exceeding way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are eternal. The things which are seen are temporary. Spiritual is more important than the physical. We get so caught up with the physical and being happy and joyous in this life. We get so caught up with making a living with doing this, doing that, and we lose sight so many times of the Scriptures and reading and studying the Scriptures. And so many Christians say, well, I just don't have time anymore to do that. And they're allowing the physical to take precedence over the spiritual instead of the spiritual taking precedence over the physical. But Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Physical is not that important. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's why Paul would tell Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Study God's word. If you want to be approved of God, you have to study it. Study His word. But what happens if we don't study His Word? You're not going to be approved of God. It's as simple as that. If you want to be approved, you have to study. And that means work. It doesn't come easy. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. But how many of us are willing to work at studying God's Word? But then we have to take that word and we have to apply it to our life. In 1 John, the first chapter, he talks about verse 5, Here is God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6, If any say that he has fellowship with God and walks in darkness, he lies and does not the truth. But if we walk in the light, verse 7, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we walk in the light, there's the application of God's Word to our life so that we are living according to those precepts that we find within the pages of the Bible. We take that Word and we apply it to our life, and what happens? We walk then in the light. In second chapter, 1 John. In verse 14, John says, I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. 
Do we have God's Word abiding in us? Uh, some individuals, and it's becoming very popular today within the church, to say that, well, the Holy Spirit helps you to do a so certain thing. Well, that's not what this is saying. The Holy Spirit does it, but He does it through the Word of God. And we've got to study the Word of God in order to overcome the wicked one. But by studying the Word of God and allowing that Word of God to abide in us, what is it? We overcome Satan. We can overcome the temptation. And that's verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Amen. Love the world. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What is it? You allow God's word to abide in you. What does that do? That helps you to overcome the wicked one. Overcome Satan. And the temptations that Satan are going to bring upon you, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Why? Because you have a love for God. That's first and foremost within your life. And based upon that love of God, then I study His Word and apply that Word to my life. I allow God's Word to abide in me. It doesn't take some direct action of the Holy Spirit upon my heart or your heart in order to overcome Satan. It takes using that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. And when I take that Word of God and apply it in my life, then I overcome Satan. I can live that successful, that Christian life, and I can have eternal life based upon that. But then also in that obedience, I have to continue to confess my sins. We read in chapter 1 of 1 John how that uh, verse 5, God is light, in Him is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, we lie and do not the truth. He says if then at verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanseth us from all sin. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then in verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John is, is a beautiful book in the original language. A lot of times we don't get the understanding that is portrayed by the original and the tenses that John uses. In, in verse 7, for example, if we walk in the light, that word walk there is, again, present tense. It is a continuous action. If we continue to walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. And again, fellowship is present tense, continuous action. We continue to have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, present tense, cleanseth us, continues to cleanse us from all sin. If we say that we have not sinned, he uses aorist tense now instead of present tense. That is a one-time, basically completed act. In the Greek, it's many times referred to as punctiliar action, point action. If we say that we do not sin, point action, not continuous action. So if we say that I never commit a sin, we lie and do not the truth. On the other hand, the Christian does not sin, we'll see later on in 1 John. He cannot sin, but he uses present tense there, not, point, not aorist tense. He doesn't continue to sin. He cannot continue to sin. But if we say that we don't commit isolated acts of sin, we lie and do not the truth. Well, how do we take care of that situation? Verse 9 then tells us, if we confess our sins. But the word confess there is again present tense. It is continuous action. So here I am walking in the light. But what happens? 
I, in walking in the light, will commit an isolated act of sin. So what, do I, what am I doing? As I'm walking in the light, I am continuing to confess my sins. That's when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sins. We recognize my weaknesses. I, I recognize I commit sin. And I live in a state of confessing those sins. Confessing that yes, I do transgress God's word. Even as I'm walking in the light. Even as I'm doing everything that I can to overcome sin. I'm trying to allow that word of God to abide in my heart so that I will overcome sin, but I still will commit isolated acts of sin. I'm confessing that sin on a regular basis, continually doing that, and the blood of Jesus Christ then continues to cleanse me of my sin. I have salvation then. It continues to cleanse us. Again, present tense, continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, as we study the scriptures, apply them to our life, allowing the spiritual to take precedence over our life, we recognize, yes, we will still fall short. We will still commit a sin here and there, but I will confess that sin on a regular basis. I'm living a life of recognizing that I do commit sin. And when I do that, and that's my lifestyle, then the blood of Jesus Christ is there to cleanse me of my sin. And God is there to forgive me of that sin. And in forgiving me of that sin, we see in Hebrews the eighth chapter and verse thirteen, he says that I will bring to their remember. I will it will be forgiven, it, and in that that forgiven their sins and their iniquities, he says, will I remember no more. The idea there is not that they are totally forgotten because God can't forget anything, but they will never be brought up against us again. As far as God is concerned, they have never taken place. Why? Because they've been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Christianity is truly the place of beginning again. When we fall, when we falter, we can truly begin again. And we can live thus that life that God wants us to live, walking in the light, <clears throat> confessing our sins, and then we have the blood of Jesus Christ continually to cleanse our sins. And we can know thus we have eternal salvation. If you've never obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, then upon your faith, repent of your sins. Make the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that you believe such. And then let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of those sins. Being raised up out of that watery grave of baptism now in Christ, a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. To walk in newness of life, Romans 6 and verse 4. To walk in the light, 1 John 1 and verse 7. And if there's sin that is within your life that you need to receive forgiveness of, and that sin is of a public nature, then we can publicly confess. Because confession deals with taking care of the sin. If I've sinned against Joe Blow over here, I go to Joe Blow and make it right with Joe Blow. If I've sinned against a multitude of people, then I go in a public way and make confession of those sins. If I brought reproach upon the church of our Lord, that beautiful body that he died for, and I, yes, publicly confess my wrong and start living the way that God wants me to live again. Living and walking in the light. Living in faithfulness to God. Studying God's Word and applying it to our life. If you need to come this morning to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ or to come and confessing your sins as a child of God who has gone astray, then why not come as we stand and sing the invitation song?